Hi, my name's Andy, and in a slight change to my normal uh, topics videos, uh, this video is about the basic concepts of Christianity, uh, the sort of main ideas uh, of what is a Christian and how does Christianity work. Um, uh, it comes from a particular perspective. Uh, I am a Christian, and I am from a tradition which would normally be called uh, Protestant Evangelical tradition. Um, I wouldn't say I'm exactly mainstream thinker in uh, in that tradition, but uh, obviously it comes from a perspective. Uh, main summary of uh, what I'm going to cover, uh, the idea that God made everything, but then that everything went wrong or is wrong. Uh, the idea that there is a sacrifice needed uh, to put things right, and then that God made that sacrifice. And I'm going to talk about our response to that, and I'm going to talk about some problems that I have understanding and accepting this uh, this worldview uh, and we can go for some to ask questions. So I should start off by saying um, everything in this is my opinion, um, my experience or um, or my opinion about what other people think sometimes. Uh, it's absolutely guaranteed to be wrong um, if you believe the Bible, because the Bible says that God can't be understood. Uh, I don't have any formal training in theology. Um, I've spent quite a lot of my life struggling with these questions and thinking about them, trying to figure out what I think. So, let's start with God made everything. So, Christianity um, says that there is a God, and that this God is a person, or a personality. Um, not just a force, or um, something completely separate from us, but a personality, um, a person uh, who exists and interacts with the world, um, uh, and also that God made the world good, um, that he was pleased with it, and, and uh, he liked it, and he liked humans. A uh, little quote there from a book in the Bible called, called Genesis, uh, just to uh, give you some further reading. So I'm, I'm going to refer to various bits of the Bible, which is the Christian, uh, the main Christian book that um, most Christians get their understanding of God from. Um, I'm going to give you uh, references into the Bible, uh, not to try and prove uh, anything to you. If you don't believe the Bible, then it won't make any difference to you. But um, uh, in case you want to read more about and understand more about the ideas. Uh, yeah, so God uh, God saw that it was good. He was pleased with what he'd made, including us. Uh, in Christianity, the fact that God exists is kind of just assumed or given, uh, not explained, um, which neatly sidesteps the question that you otherwise have to deal with, which is, uh, why is there anything at all? In, uh, Christianity just says, well, God is God is the reason why everything else is there, and we don't really understand why God is there. Okay, so in order to um, make any sense in this world, we need to move on from this idea that everything is good to understand why sometimes things are bad. Uh, and what Christianity says is that uh, basically everything went wrong. Uh, everything has now gone wrong. Um, and some aspects of that include the fact that people do bad things. Um, uh, and, it, and bad things don't just happen to people when they deserve it. Bad things happen... Um, to people who have done nothing wrong, uh, a good example of um, if you're if you're struggling with this kind of idea is to um, look at the book of Job in the Bible, uh, who was a good man who suffered terrible things, um, and uh, uh, said some very radical things about God, and how God had uh, it was God's fault. Um, so. Uh, uh, there are stories in the Bible that that illustrate the fact that uh, humanity bears some or all of the responsibility for the fact that everything's wrong. Um, uh, in particular, the story of Adam and Eve, um, which I take to be a picture of something rather than something that literally happened to two people. Um, uh, it, they did something wrong, and that meant that uh, the rest of us live in uh, a state of of being punished or not or outside of the kind of ideal state that we humanity started off in. So it, this is, there's a definitely a sense that um, humanity bears some or all of the responsibility for everything being wrong. Um, I think it's also clear 
uh, that God bears some or all responsibility for this state of affairs. Uh, it, uh, absolutely minimally, God could have just not made anything, and then this state of affairs wouldn't be here. So at least to that extent, God bears some responsibility. But as I was saying, the book of Job and other places in the Bible, especially the book of Job, um, uh, allows us to consider the idea that um, God bears responsibility for um, the kind of the wrongness of the world, along with people who obviously cause a lot of the bad things in the world. Um, at least the book of Job uh, shows that God can tolerate us having a go at him, even if it turns out in the end that we're wrong. Um, he seemed to quite like it um, from a lot of the people in the Bible who are pretty cheeky to him. Uh, okay, so once we've got this, um, the, the basics established that God made the world and it was good and then it, and something went wrong, um, the question uh, needs to come up of uh, what do we do about it? So um, it seems a clear message from the Old Testament, which is the part of the Bible, which is uh, uh, Jewish writing, which is accepted by Christians as being part of their um, their book, um, accepted as, as the Word of God. Um, so all through the Old Testament, it's clear that uh, when someone does something wrong, and you have to do something about it. And the thing that you do about it um, is you kind of represent uh, the punishment being done and dealt with um, by killing animals, basically, by performing these sacrifices. Um, so an example of that is this passage from Leviticus, uh, and in particular, um, the purpose of the sacrifice uh, uh, in that passage is clear, it's to make atonement, so it's to, it's to kind of make up for things that people have done wrong, which isn't, it's not always what all the sacrifices that are described uh, in the Old Testament are for, but um, some of them are to make atonement or to make up for things that people have done wrong. Um, so and what I'm trying to get across is this idea that in order to put things right when things have gone wrong, when someone's done something wrong, there has to be a punishment, um, there has to be um, a sacrifice and and what God asked the people to do, uh, or told the people to do, before this person called Jesus came along, who we'll talk about in a second, is to kill animals. Uh, and it's clear to me, at least, that that's a symbolic action, that actually um, killing an animal doesn't make any difference to the thing you did wrong, doesn't make it any better or, or take away the effects of it. Um, but it, it's a symbol which is intended to teach us something uh, and, I, and I'm saying it's intended to teach us that a sacrifice is needed, a punishment um, or some kind of justice is needed, and that this transferred punishment is an acceptable way of doing that, rather than the person who did the thing wrong being killed, you kill an animal instead. And these are quite difficult ideas for us to understand, I think. I don't think it, it, these are particularly popular ideas in our culture. Um, but if you think about when someone does some awful thing wrong, um, that sense that we all have that there's a need for justice to be done, for a punishment to be uh, to be dealt out when someone's hurt someone terribly, um, you know, you sort of cry out for justice to be done. Um, the idea that this can be transferred onto someone else or something else is also a difficult idea. Um, it, it, and an easier idea is to understand is if someone pays off someone else's debts and you can see that that's um, kind of acceptable. The idea of someone taking someone else's prison sentence or something like that is a difficult idea um, for us. Uh, but I think that that's the principle that's established uh, in the Old Testament, which is the bit of the Bible, which is the Jewish writings, which is before you hear anything about Jesus, um, apart from prophecies that we'll get onto. So, here is my own very personal, made-up summary of what the Old Testament says. Uh, uh, which is basically, uh, as I see it, it's the story of God um, choosing a particular people group to teach about him, um, to um, use them as his kind of God specialist so that they can figure out things about him, gradually learn what's right and what's wrong. Uh, what God is like and how he how he works, how he deals with people. So, 
the first thing you learn is that uh, God is love. Maybe not the first thing you learn. One of the things that I think is clear through the, through the Old Testament is that God is love. I.e., he's very loving, uh, so loving that uh, that you, you can use that phrase. God is love, as in he sort of invented love and um, is much better at uh, loving us than we are loving each other. Um, secondly, um, we learn from the Old Testament. I think that that we shouldn't do bad things, and that, that this is very very serious. Um, God really really doesn't like people doing bad things. Thirdly. If you look at the relationship that God has with the, this country of Israel through the Old Testament, um, he punishes them and he forgives them, um, and he brings them back to him again and again and again, even though, um, if you read it, there's a real sense that they, they don't deserve it at all because they, they've done such awful things, they've turned away from him completely, they've, they've not kept any of the promises they made to him, um, but, and, and he does punish them for the things they do wrong. Um, but he also forgives them, brings them back to him again and again and again, and there's this repetitiveness to it. He sort of never gives up on them, and you feel like, you know, surely he, at some point you ought to give up on them, but he never does. Um, and I think that's the experience a lot of people feel, um, feel their experience in their, li- in their life as a Christian, in their, their personal relationship with God. Uh, thirdly, fourthly, the, the fact, as I was saying on the last slide, that, that a sacrifice is needed in order for forgiveness to happen. Uh, is a clear sort of message of the Old Testament. And then lastly, there, there are prophecies which um, the Jews took to mean that a, a king was coming, um, and Christians take to mean, uh, are talking about uh, Jesus, and that Jesus was this king or this Messiah, this saviour uh, who was coming. So there are passages which talk about um, a king coming, uh, someone who's greater than David, who's one of the great kings. Um, there are also passages that talk about how there's a figure who um, uh, was humiliated and hurt and took the punishment for um, for everyone doing things wrong. Um, and Christians, at least, consider these to be the same person, the same Messiah, um, this king who's also... Uh, who's also humiliated and hurt um, to take punishment for other people. And Christians say that this person uh, was a a real historical person who really lived called Jesus, Jesus Christ. So um, uh, Christianity says that that God made the the sort of ultimate sacrifice, so there's no need to kill animals anymore, because those were kind of a symbol teaching us um, about this concept that then came along. So what happened was God became a human. So God, um, God was still in heaven, but he also uh, was on earth as a human. Uh, uh, this human called Jesus, uh, who didn't do anything wrong. And he became uh, a sacrifice by, by dying. He became a sacrifice that um, makes up for everything that everyone's done wrong. So these, uh, the, killing these animals was kind of a symbol um of what was coming, which was that God himself, uh, by becoming a human and then uh, doing nothing wrong and dying, would become a, a kind of ultimate sacrifice that really did make up for the, that did have meaning. So, you know, when I was saying the, the killing of the animals it doesn't really actually do anything, uh, what Christianity says is that the, the killing of Jesus does actually do something and it, and it provides a sufficient sacrifice. Uh, it, he takes the punishment. Um, uh, that was coming to all of us for doing things wrong. Um, he takes he takes it all away, uh, makes available for us um, to be forgiven through that that one sacrifice. Important aspect of the sacrifices in the Old Testament is that the animals that are getting sacrificed uh, have to be perfect. They have to have nothing wrong with them. Um, so the fact that Jesus did nothing wrong is important in that it fits in with that that picture of the thing that needs to be sacrificed needs to be something sort of pure. Um, and again, the animals having nothing wrong with them is a sort of symbolic purity, um, symbolic flawlessness. Um, and then Jesus comes along with this non-symbolic, real flawlessness that makes him uh, capable of being the real non-symbolic sacrifice um, that makes it possible for us to be forgiven by God and therefore have a relationship with God. Uh, it's probably worth pausing there to say, I kind of 
I really do mean relationship like a friendship or um, or uh, a mother daughter relationship mother or mother son relationship or father daughter relationship or father son relationship um, or friendship or or brotherliness you know the, um, Christians will tell you that, that that in some sense they have a friendship a relationship with God um, even though most of them say that most of the time they're not then the they're not physically experiencing um, the, the presence of a, a physical person in the same room, or you know, can't touch God, or um, or normally can't hear him speaking. Some Christians will say that for occasionally they've heard an actual voice speaking to them. Um, uh, I don't think I have, but uh, but I do feel that there is that I do experience a relationship with God um, through the kind of interactions with him in my mind by praying and feeling that he's speaking to me. Um, it's, it's quite hard to explain. It's clearly not the same thing as a relationship with um, the people in my life, but it, it feels that it, in some way it has this uh, similar character. Sometimes I feel like God is laughing at me or comforting me, things like that. Um, so, yeah, that word relationship is used uh, advisedly. Uh, okay, anyway, that was a sidetrack. Uh, so, God made the sacrifice, and the key points are, no one deserves this sacrifice. Um, no one no one gets this gift of being able to be forgiven, because um, they were so so good that they were really easily forgivable. Uh, no one earns being forgiven by God by being really good or, or nice. God just did it when we didn't deserve it. Um, so you don't earn it, and you don't initiate it, but there is an offer that is made to all of us uh, to be forgiven and, and get into that relationship with God that I was just talking about. Um, and we can respond to that offer. Um, and it's also really important to point out that um, Christians, by saying they're a Christian, do not they're not saying that they don't do anything wrong, or that they're now good and perfect. Uh, an example of that is that passage you, you can see at the bottom there, uh, where Paul is saying um, that he, he wants to do the right stuff, but actually he finds himself doing the wrong thing again. So this is someone who is a Christian, who is forgiven. It doesn't suddenly make you um, never do anything wrong. So if you meet Christians who do things wrong, um, you uh, don't be surprised by that. Um, the, what they're claiming for themselves is not that they've stopped doing things wrong, but that God has forgiven them for the things that they do do wrong. So um, our response to that uh, trying to behave well, trying to do good things, is a response to the forgiveness that's available, not not a way of earning uh, forgiveness or a way of getting into God's good books. It's just responding to something that God's already given to us. So, uh, like that that quote from Peter, there, um, get get rid of all malice because now, now that you've tasted that God is good. So it's a response to tasting that God is good, um, you know, experiencing this love in your own life uh, and this goodness, that you want to uh, live up to that and, uh, and, and show that love to other people. So it's a response, not, a, not something that means that you get forgiven because you were nice enough. Um, there is no minimum entry criterion. There's no one who's too bad. Um, I sometimes meet people who say, I want to become a Christian, but I just need to sort my life out first. Um, but, and the message... Uh, of Christianity, I, w I would say to you, if you're in that position, is um, that the offer of forgiveness is available to you um, without any change to you. The change will come as part of your response to the forgiveness you get, and and it will actually make it possible, uh, to make change possible. So there's no minimum entry criterion. For example, Paul, this guy Paul again, writing in this book called 1 Timothy, uh, he describes himself as the worst of sinners. He was actually going around killing Christians and overseeing the, the killing of Christians uh, before he converted to become a Christian. Uh, and he, he considered himself to be kind of the worst possible sinner there could be. Um, done, uh, done the worst things, um, but he was shown mercy. So he's as an example of uh, someone in a bad place uh, who, who didn't come out of that bad place to become a Christian but became a Christian and then came out of that bad place. So, to repeat again, there is no minimum entry criteria. Um, you, you can never be too bad to become a Christian. 
um, because forgiveness, the forgiveness that uh, is offered from God is a free gift, um, and it's something that gives us freedom. Um, the freedom it gives us is that we get to live without the, what, what it refers to sometimes as the burden of sin, or uh, like in the passage below, um, sin shall no longer be your master. So there's this idea that uh, sin kind of traps you in, and you can't um, get out of it. So uh, here, by the way, I'm, I know I've realised I'm using the word sin without uh, explaining what it means. But sin just means doing bad things. Um, and so you can be trapped in uh, into patterns of behaviour that um, are harmful to you and to other people. And the claim of Christianity is that um, through the Holy Spirit, through this um, further part of God, we talked about God being in heaven and, and then God coming to earth in the form of Jesus. Um, uh, and there's this third part of God that's talked about, which is called the Holy Spirit, which is essentially God being inside us and um, helping us, uh, teaching us, speaking to us, uh, either literally with words or more commonly in my case, or only in my case, uh, sort of uh, feeling that God is communicating something to me non-verbally. Uh, through the Holy Spirit uh, living in you, working with you, um, there can be freedom from being trapped in by behaviours that we can't get ourselves out of. Uh, and if you speak to a Christian, ask them about that. Many Christians will tell you that through, yeah, as part of their journey of being a Christian, um, uh, they will have been helped by God to get out of behaviours that were harmful and realise things they were doing wrong they hadn't even realised before. So just to repeat again, there is no minimum entry criterion. There's nothing stopping you from accepting this gift. The reason you need the gift of forgiveness is because um, because you can't achieve any kind of minimum criterion. That's why you need to accept it as a gift. So Christianity says there is there is this completely freely available gift. All you have to do is uh, it, you kind of have to believe that God is there uh, in order to be able to speak to Him, and then say, yes, I accept this, this gift from you and I want to turn around from the things that I'm doing wrong. It doesn't come from um, from something that the person does. It comes from God saying, here you go, here's this thing you can have. But uh, once that happens, we then will respond to that. Uh, and this is most uh, sort of clearly outlined that, that there's, it's expected that there will be a response in this book called James, which was quite controversial until people sort of started to read it right. And what James is saying is, um, if you if you say that you follow Jesus, but you don't, it doesn't actually affect your behaviour. Then you don't, you're not really you haven't really gone through that experience of starting to follow Jesus, accepting this forgiveness that's available. Um, so this response will definitely happen um, of basically trying to to do good things. Um, but that doesn't stop it from being a response, not a, not something that, that gets you. You don't get to be a Christian because of what you do. You just do things as a response to God forgiving you. So let's have a slight sidetrack and talk about this living without the burden of sin thing. So um, uh, what Christians will say, what Christianity says, uh, mostly, by the way, from reading uh, the Bible is where most of these ideas come from. Um, although sometimes more, uh, years and years of, of Christians studying the Bible together to come to a clear idea of what they mean. Um, this idea of living without the burden of sin is that, that there's a freedom not to do it again. So we know, although we know we will uh, uh, sin again and make mistakes again, um, uh, Christians would say that, they're, that they're, God makes it possible for them to avoid those sins and breaks breaks them out of the kind of trap of these behaviours that are irresistible, but they still make mistakes. So that, I think that's quite a hard thing to explain. But if you ask a Christian about that, uh, you may well find that they agree that they do feel that there's this new freedom from being a Christian that gets them out of it's sort of inevitably being trapped in by sins. Um, it also gives you freedom from feeling guilty about um, the things that you've done wrong. Uh, you you might need to. Uh, do something about them, you know, say sorry to someone or, or make amends. But um, often there are sins in our life that are, are long gone that still cause us trouble. 
um, and knowing that you're forgiven by God can give you freedom from uh, the guilt of the, uh, those sins. Um, and furthermore, uh, this forgiveness means that we get to be with God forever. So I've got a little quote at the bottom there, um, which is a quote from Jesus talking about the resurrection, which is when people um, come back to life again uh, at the end of the world. So Jesus, uh, clearly from this this part and other places in the, in the Bible, believed that, that people would physically really come back to life um, and be with God. It would be a, a new world, a different world that's much better without uh, the bad things that we experience now. Um, so by accepting this forgiveness, it basically, in the same way that the people of Israel experienced this um, have, sort of having to be sent away from God as a sort of punishment and then being brought back to God, that their forgiveness meant they could get back into a relationship with God. Uh, exactly the same pattern um, uh, is what happens for individuals, according to Christianity, that you, um, by being forgiven by God, it lets you back into uh, having a relationship with God, um, and that relationship with God can go on forever, um, it starts immediately. It doesn't start. You don't have to sort of wait around for it until you die or until the end of the world. It starts immediately, but it continues after death into um, getting to be with God forever. So back to our response. Uh, so the kinds of things uh, that Jesus taught about that should be our response to um, this uh, this forgiveness that we receive. Um, again, it's just coming back to the thing that I was saying about what I feel is part of the message of the Old Testament, which is that um, doing things wrong, your own sin, uh, is very, very serious. You know, the um, the response that God has in the Old Testament to the things Israel does wrong is never, oh well, it'll be okay. It was only a little thing that you did wrong. It's always that these these wrong things are extremely serious and need to be dealt with and got rid of. Um, and that message comes through from Jesus in the New Testament as well, uh, which is the part of the Bible that uh, Christians uh, use to understand Jesus and the consequences of uh, Jesus coming, of God coming as a man and uh, being sacrificed. Um, so there's lots of quotations from Jesus, and I believe the uh, number one quote that I've listed here is Jesus saying, if your right eye makes you sin, then pluck it out. And if your foot makes you sin, then cut it off. Um, so it, it, it he may not have meant that literally, um, but he certainly meant that you should take it very, very seriously. If you do anything wrong, you should prevent yourself. You should work hard not to do anything wrong. Uh, and we have the Holy Spirit to help with that. Um, we can pray and ask that God will help us. Um, but G Jesus seems to be saying this is extremely serious. We can't, you can't just put up with it and let it go and deal with it later. We have to worry about it a lot and fight against our own sin. Secondly, Jesus um, uh, and the rest of the Bible talks a lot about um, defending the weak. Um, the passage that I've linked to there. Uh, is Jesus at the end of the world saying to people, um, uh, I don't know you because there were weak people who uh, needed helping and you didn't help them. So a uh, very strong message all through the Bible, not just from Jesus, but through the Old Testament and the New Testament, looking after people who need looking after. Thirdly, something that Jesus um, modelled very strongly was uh, praying a lot, spending a lot of time doing this thing called praying, which is trying to talk to God and listen to God, um, something which is hard to understand and hard to do. Um, but uh, if you're having trouble with that bit, I'd encourage you that it, it, you can't really do it wrong. You, all, it, all you can do is try try and talk to God, and uh, um, it, it'll be all right with that, I reckon. Uh, but Jesus, a lot of the stories in the Bible so Jesus went off somewhere to pray quietly, but then a whole load of crowd of people followed him, so he had to do some preaching. Uh, so he spent a lot of time trying to find a quiet place to talk to God, which is weird because he was God, um, but clearly he was um, God in a form who didn't, who couldn't see everything, know everything, didn't have complete physical power over everything, I don't think, um, but was able to have do miracles and things by... Um, uh, through his his relationship with God, which wasn't so with with God the Father who's in heaven, um, 
which wasn't so different from the relationship that's available to us when we're forgiven. The, the, the obstacles between us and God are taken out of the way because um, God forgives us. Um, means that we can have a similar kind of relationship with God and have access to the kind of knowledge and power that uh, Jesus had through praying. Uh, but it does seem that uh, you can only uh, kind of get the benefits of uh, the Holy Spirit helping you get out of sin and um, or even do miracles or or just hear things from God and all that stuff. You need to actually spend time praying um, or meditating and talking to God. Um, uh, and, and that's how God kind of works with us, uh, s- says things to us and changes us, helps us follow him. Okay, so fourthly... Um, there's a strong message through all of the Bible that you have to give up absolutely all of your power and ambition, all the power over your life, all your ambitions, completely to God. And that is a daily, ongoing um, struggle. But they, um, that, uh, the, the way that's put in the Old Testament is love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul. And Jesus uh, repeated that as one of the most important commandments. Um, you have to give up everything. That's really hard. Um, but very satisfying and takes away, it takes a lot of stress out of your life if you can do that, even for a moment. Uh, experience that kind of giving up of power and letting uh, God be in control. Uh, and lastly, uh, loving your enemies. So I, I, would, I would say that the, the kind of journey of learning about God through the Bible that I was trying to describe earlier through the Old Testament, um, it starts off with people not really knowing what's right and what's wrong, or whether, whether, for example, child sacrifices are a good thing or not. Uh, lots of the um, countries around at the time of Abraham were doing child sacrifices, and God, through this kind of nasty trick of, of almost getting Abraham to sacrifice his child, and then saying, no, don't do that, is teaching Abraham uh, that child sacrifice is wrong. Anyway, so you start off with people don't really know what's right or what's wrong, um, gradually learning... You don't murder, don't uh, move people's boundary stones, uh, so on and so on. All these things that, uh, and especially uh, protect the weak. And if someone sleeps in your village square overnight um, and no one takes them into their home, then there's shame on your village and so on. Gradually more sophisticated understanding of, of what, what's right and what's wrong. And then uh, my feeling is that that journey of discovery of what God is like or what good and what right and wrong are like uh, continues with Jesus where he says, don't just do things that are reasonable. Uh, don't just um, you know, punish people when they do things wrong and stop people hurting people who are weak and stop people lying in court and so on and so on. But go much further than that and give to people beyond what's reasonable uh, and love people when it's not reasonable um, because they're your enemy. Uh, and that's a very hard thing to do. Um, but I think that, it, you know, it's as hard as the hate and fight your own sin uh, and defending the weak parts is something that um, uh, the Holy Spirit helps us with. Um, we'll never get completely right. But um, we should never try and water down the things that Jesus said to... Um, uh, well, that basically means you have to live a kind of reasonable life. I think that what Jesus was saying is you have to live an unreasonable life where you give up. Um, your own interests uh, in exchange for other people's. Um, so, um, problems and worries that I have with this worldview, this uh, religion. Um, one that's very common, and there's all different levels of sophistication uh, of this view, from very uh, simple expressions of it through to very sort of complex theological expressions. But, but basically, the problem is. If God made everything, and God is a nice guy, why is everything so bad? Why are so many people hurt um, in so many different ways, in in ways that are down to humans and in ways that are not down to humans? Um, and that's a very difficult problem to think about. Uh, to me, the thing that makes me able to kind of live with it, sit with it, even though it's difficult, is that I don't think God minds us telling him about this and saying that it's unfair. Uh, I take my evidence from Job and from lots of other people in the Bible who who moaned at God a lot. And God seemed to think that that was basically not just... He didn't just put up with it. Often he sort of encouraged it and felt like 
you know, fi- maybe even he thought, well, finally here's someone who'll be honest with me and uh, um, tell me what they're really thinking. So that's not an answer, but it, it helps me sit with it. Uh, another problem that has uh, caused me real problems from time to time is why on earth would you believe something that's so arbitrary? There are so many potential belief system belief systems in the world. Uh, why have you picked this particular structure of belief? Um, and they, that's that's a very difficult question to answer. Uh, but I think you know the only thing that that makes it you know if I'd made this belief system up from nowhere, then I think it would be completely unreasonable. Um, but if I see a kind of a progression of learning about God through um, through the history of um, ancient times uh, and through the time of Jesus and through to now, if I see um, the experience of lots of people who um, have experienced God and, and what they said about it, and I try and build up from that a picture of what God is like, then it's not quite as arbitrary as it first seems. Um, but it's clear that there are other belief systems uh, which also have uh, long-standing traditions and um, uh, evidence in that sense of the people's experience. Um, so, yeah, I guess I'm arbitrarily choosing this one because it seems right to me. And the reasons why it seems right to me include uh, that this is what I was taught as a child. And there's no denying that. It still seems right to me. So what, what can I do? Um, other problems. Um, uh, Christians do bad things. And in particular, some people uh, with this, who are expressing this problem, what they really mean is Christians have done awful things to me in the past. Um, either, either terrible things um, uh, th- that would be terrible in any context or things like rejecting people from churches and making them making them outsiders which I think uh, is uh, often is com- completely against what it says in the Bible about uh, bringing people in and protecting the weak and the, and the vulnerable so yeah I think we talked about this a little bit about how um, we shouldn't really expect Christians to, to um, never to do anything wrong I mean, we should see over the whole sweep of a Christian's life uh, God kind of showing them things they're doing wrong and helping them work through them and um, and change. We should definitely see change over the long term of a Christian's life. But you won't always see that in every Christian that you see. Um, uh, but yeah, just because you get to be forgiven by God doesn't mean that you suddenly don't do anything wrong. So to some extent, there's an answer to, to that on a sort of logical level. Um, but on an emotional level, um, this is, can be a very hard problem to deal with. Um, and lastly, something that bothers me is why is believing in God such an important uh, factor? Why can't you sort of you live in a posture of of repentance, which means turning around from your sin, which is what happens when you accept this forgiveness from God, you turn around and go the other way. Um, why is it so important that you believe that God's really there when you do that? And, and to some extent, I think it's it's to do with this relationship that I was, thing I was talking about before. What uh, what God is looking for is to have a friendship or a, um, a family relationship with us, um, and that's just not possible if we don't think He's even there. So, um, in a way, it's just a prerequisite for coming into that relationship with God. But I find that troubling. That why does why does my friend who just doesn't believe in God, why uh, are they excluded from this? But I think, yeah. In a way, it's just, it's impossible to have a relationship with someone you don't believe in. But uh, It does mean that I don't know how to speak to someone who just says, well, I just don't believe in God. I don't know where to start um, speaking to that person about this, this great thing that I, I want to tell them about. Um, you know, I guess there are ways, the ways to talk about um, the, uh, the idea that there must be something because... You need to ask, you need to ask the question: Why did anything happen in the first place? Like I was saying at the beginning, why why are there laws of the universe? Uh, uh, you know, why is there anything at all? So maybe believing in God as a kind of arbitrary thing that we we've decided or we believe exists 
um, is just as crazy as believing in that the laws of the universe have always existed or something else. I don't know. <clears throat> Still doesn't necessarily get you there if you if you just don't believe in God. But I guess all I could say, if you're in a position of just not believing in God, but you're interested in what I'm talking about, uh, just try praying anyway, even though even though you don't believe in God, just see if you can talk to him. Um, and hopefully, uh, hopefully you'll get somewhere with that. So, if you have any questions about this and you want to talk to me about it, um, I'd be really happy uh, to uh, to talk to you by email about this on, on that email address. Um, I'd also, uh, it'd be much better probably to talk to a Christian that you know or try going to a church. Um, and if no one talks to you, try just grabbing uh, the person who was speaking at the front or something and saying, you know, I'm sort of interested in this stuff, but I don't know where to look. Could you point me somewhere. Maybe you could go along to a, a small group where people who are interested in this stuff get together and talk about it. Or, uh, or maybe you used to be a Christian and you kind of can't, uh, haven't bothered with it for years. Or maybe um, go along to a church, see if there's a small group that you could go to um, where they, they do Bible studies or pray together or something and just um, listen to see whether you're interested. Uh, so yeah, ch definitely look for a local church. Um, but if you really want to email me to see what I think about something, I'd be really happy to do that. Um, there's loads of websites. Uh, some of them are crazy, some of them aren't. And whether or not you think they're crazy is going to depend on you. Um, but yeah, ha be cautious with what you read. Uh, and if you read stuff that's full of hatred, then uh, know that I myself uh, want nothing to do with that and don't feel that that is an expression of, of what Jesus taught us to be like. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, more information about me, uh, if you like these videos and you want to donate money to encourage me to make more, have a look at my Patreon page. Uh, if you like uh, rescuing rabbits in puzzling type adventures on your phone or your computer, check out Rabbit Escape on the Play Store or free to download from the website. More videos on my YouTube channel. Follow me on Twitter for um, stuff to do with my open source projects and videos. Follow my blog for stuff to do with my open source projects and videos. Uh, look at artificialworlds.net for a, a li an almost comprehensive list of a massive number of partially abandoned open source projects and some that are still going. And uh, see you next time for something more programming related.